The first generation Tacoma was my first automotive love. Maybe it's nostalgia from my teenage years, or perhaps these glorious standard deaf commercials all over public television. I just love its small size, its go-anywhere reputation, and its reliability. Well, except for when your frame can blow away after a strong sneeze. That, that's not really cool, man. A couple of years ago, I picked up the Tacoma Sibling, the third generation 4Runner. I was surprised by how quickly I fell in love with this vehicle that can't love me back. Even stock, the 4Runner is remarkably capable and comfortable. Like a real sibling rivalry, I could feel the Tacoma become jealous as I took the 4Runner on adventures and got in a few precarious situations. The 4Runner has features that the Tacoma doesn't, and at first, I didn't know I needed. Like how the rear hatch window rolls down. This turns out to be perfect for when your lactose intolerant girlfriend splurges on dairy products and fills the cab with toxic gases. But more on subject, the 4Runner has the multi-mode T-case, which has both all-wheel drive and four-wheel drive modes. Okay, so what? Big deal. Why do you even need both? They're both the same, right? False. All-wheel drive is perfect for windy roads like this, where conditions switch rapidly from high traction to low traction. In these situations, constantly shifting between two-wheel drive and four-wheel drive become impractical. In conditions like this, I tend to favor the 4Runner, which leaves the Tacoma alone in the garage while its sibling talks smack about all the attention it's getting. Say, hey, man. You got Selectable all-wheel drive. Uh, no, not on me, man. <laughs> It'd be a lot cooler if you did. <laughs> but what if the Tacoma had all-wheel drive? Maybe then I will give them equal attention. In this video, I will attempt something that hasn't been done. Or at least, I can't find it after searching the internet for 10 seconds. So really, does it even exist? I don't mean this video to be a how-to. I've been researching and planning this project for a while. But if you're looking for more technical details, check out my forum post where I include things like tables, diagrams, pictures, paragraphs, and words. To appreciate this modification fully, you'll probably need to understand what a differential does. I'll link to this full video, it's probably the best explanation I've seen on the internet. I can also explain it with these LEGO models I built. Let me know if you want to see a video on that. The 4Runner is equipped with the multi-mode transfer case, which has a lockable center differential built right in. This allows for it to have both all-wheel drive and four-wheel drive modes. Simply put, all we need to do to give the Tacoma all-wheel drive is to swap in the multi-mode T-case. Almost too easy. Let's get some parts off a third gen 4Runner. Multi-mode transfer case, with harness section, front drive shaft, the four-wheel drive controller and center diff lock switch, and the instrument cluster. There's really only seven, seven easy seven, steps. Seven, seven. Take out the old T-case, put in the new T-case, put in the controller, make an indicator, install a switch, connect it up, then drive off victorious. All right, let's break that down a little bit. Let's start by removing the Tacoma's old T-case and replace it with the new 22-year-old T-case. Both the front drive shaft and the rear drive shaft will need to come out in order to get the T-case out. I have some of these fasteners are really tight. It would really suck if the wrench. <laughs> slipped. Holy crap, that hurt. My thumb is okay though. Thank you for asking. With the drive shaft salsa, I now drained the oil and started disconnecting everything holding the T-case in, like electrical connections, breather lines, and even the transmission shifter linkage, which needs to be removed in order to access the T-case shift lever. Is it even a real automotive project if you don't come across one C's fastener? All the usual tricks failed me, but the bolt extractor came in for the win. In order to get the shifter assembly out, some of the interior components have to be removed. I now have access to the shifter assembly, but would you look at this? Operator, get the cops on the horn. This truck was used in a hack jobbery. It appears this simple fender screw was used to mutilate a threaded hole. My god, there's bolts with their head snapped off that have been there for years. The fellow who did this crime didn't know bumpkins about working on a truck. Judging by the state of this boot, looks like he doesn't even care if he's discovered. There's only one way to right these wrongs. Some guy on YouTube must fix it. Great, my favorite. Unplanned work. I'll need to remove the extension housing to gain access to this area. But first, I have to continue removing the T-case. And step one complete, T-case removed. Just barely clear the frame. Because I was a witness to the hack jobbery, I needed to remove the extension housing, transmission mount, and the transmission cross member. Only a couple spot welds hold this mounting plate onto the body. I drilled out the spot welds, installed new weld nuts, treated the rust, applied a fresh coat of paint, and re-welded it in. I tend to fall into the camp of, while I have this part out, why don't I replace everything freaking possible? I refresh the extension housing with new fasteners, o-rings, and seals. With fresh FIPG, I can reinstall the extension housing. During the install, I knocked the camera, so no footage beyond this. With that done, I can now prep the new T-case to be installed. A known issue on the Toyota transfer cases is the shift seat tends to disintegrate into a sand-like consistency over time, and this one was no exception. 
After giving all the parts a good cleaning, I replaced gaskets, fasteners, the shift bushing, the shift seat, and even gave it a new boot. The shift seat I got from Marlin Crawler, which should hold up better over the years. I replaced the linkage fasteners and the shifter bushings on the shifter assembly. I'll link a video from the gods of YouTube Toyota Repair, Tibby and Sean, if you're looking for a detailed how-to video on replacing the transmission and the T-case shift bushings. The Tacoma uses a vehicle speed sensor on the back of the T-case to generate a signal for the speedometer. The Forewarner uses the ABS system to measure speed. Luckily, the multi-mode transfer case has a port for this vehicle speed sensor. It is just plugged off for the Forerunner. I verified they were compatible, took out the plug, and put the sensor in its place. Now that the prep work is complete on the multi-mode transfer case, it's time to install it. One thing I won't do again is use this makeshift transmission jack. I'll give it credit for working, but it took a lot of wood scraps and shims to make the T-case line up to the extension housing. I could breathe easy after that first bolt went in. I first installed a few bolts just to hold the T-case in place. Some of these bolts are also used to secure electrical routing brackets. I apply them lock tight to all bolts before torquing them. I refreshed the extension housing to transfer case breather hose. Then I started working on reinstalling the transmission mount and the transmission cross member to the extension housing. I then connected the shifter linkages with new fasteners before moving on to the drive shafts. The multi-mode T-case is about 3 inches longer than the Tacoma T-case. The original Tacoma drive shafts will not work with the multi-mode T-case. Since the Forerunner's front drive shaft is already the proper length for the T-case, you can just use that front drive shaft. However, the rear drive shaft will need to be shortened. Although I can cut and re-weld this shaft myself, considering the loads and speeds this shaft is under, I let a specialty shop shorten and rebalance the shaft. For now, I'm only going to install this section of the drive shaft. Step 2 complete. The new old T-case is installed. It's now time to move on to mounting the controller. The Tacoma's four-wheel drive controller is located under the lower trim panel, held in by a single bolt. Here you can see the size differences between the two controllers. Although my research showed that these connectors would be the same, it was nice to physically verify. This means that the Tacoma's harness will plug right into the Forerunner's controller. In order to simplify the wiring later, I will need to mount this controller in roughly the same spot as the Tacoma's controller. I mocked up a few ways to mount the controller and to use the same bolt to mount it. I like this location and orientation. On to modifying the mounting tab to utilize that bolt. I took apart the controller to protect the circuitry inside. I cut off the mounting tab flange to make it easier to bend by hand. With a bit of trial and error, I was able to bend the mounting tab into a shape that utilized the bolts and kept the controller in the right location. I mocked it up one more time to make sure I was happy with it. I noticed this mounting strategy was a little bit flexy, so I'll need to weld gussets to both the mounting tab and the bracket the controller mounts to. But overall, I'm happy with the controller's position. I cut out some steel to reinforce the controller's mounting tab. Oh, sorry, is this fabrication footage? It's video production law to have aggressive rock music over this. Since the controller is held in by one screw and in a vertical orientation, it'll need some sort of anti-rotation feature. I drilled a hole in the bracket and put a pin on the mounting tab. Classic automotive design. To stiffen the bracket, I welded in some metal on the back side of it. Unfortunately, I didn't get any video of it. And that's step three complete, controller mounted. I really like the Forerunner's pictogram, which displays which drive mode you're in. I will adapt this pictogram for the Tacoma. Plus, it'll look like a factory installed option. Let's open the cluster and see what we're working with. I ordered the special service tool that Toyota recommended to take this apart. The instructions say tap once. Wow, not bad. I needed to figure out where to put this gauge. Embedding the gauge into the cluster would be ideal, but it's way too difficult to adapt. The factory clock location has plenty of space, but then the gauge would have the same issues as the clock. You have to crane your head around to see it. By the ECT power switch would be nice, but I plan to put the center diff lock switch there. I like the idea of putting the gauge up here. It's right in the driver's line of sight, and it's a pretty empty space. Plus, I can mount it to the A pillar and hide the wires. The plan is to put a pictogram in its own custom gauge pod. The pod will mimic the geometry of the Forerunner's instrument cluster and use these Neo Wedge LEDs to illuminate it. I designed the gauge in Fusion 360, 3D printed all the parts with UV resistant ASA, and acetone vapor smoothed them for a better appearance. I printed a jig to help me locate the holes for the LEDs. The Neo Wedges take power from the board they're mounted to. I needed to make a board with isolated electrical nodes. These nodes are just pads that power and ground can be applied to. When the bulb is installed, it is in contact with these pads. 
The pads are connected to the controller, which switches on and off based on what mode the T-case is in. Here I'm soldering on the wires that'll eventually lead to the controller. I ended up making a mistake and had to re-solder some of these wires. The exposed lead was a little too long and risked shorting out the nodes next to them. I used hot glue to act as a strain relief on these wires. And here's the board with the bulbs installed and tested. And now time for final assembly. The main body of the gauge is what directs light through these two transparencies that make up the pictogram. The board sits in a recessed channel of this back cover. If the LEDs ever need to be changed, they can be accessed by taking off this back cover. The gauge features three separate circuits that I'm going to check. All wheel drive indication, center diff lock indication, and a backlight. After mounting the gauge, this hinge will allow for left right adjustment of the face. The mounting arm has a channel and a cover, which is used to hide the wires. Despite the gauge being a little bit clunky, it works and I'm pretty happy with the result. I first mark the approximate position where I want to put the gauge. It's much easier to mount the gauge with the A-pillar off the truck. Back at the bench, I marked and drilled the first hole, installed the first bolt, then marked and drilled the second hole. The slot in the mounting arm allows the up-down angle of the gauge to be adjusted. And finally, drilling a clearance hole for the wiring and securing it to the backside of the A-pillar cover. And just like that, step four complete, make an indicator. The multi-mode T-case does not operate on voice commands. Therefore, we're going to need a switch to tell it to either lock or unlock the center differential. There was two locations that I considered. One right next to the steering column, and one next to the ECT switch. I like the latter better. The switch is more visible and easier to get to. I need a way to cleanly mount this switch in this location. I notice that all the OEM switches sit flush with the surface they're mounted to. It's going to take some additional effort to get that factory installed look. The switch essentially snaps into a countersunk hole. The plan is to copy the 3D geometry, print it, and glue it into place. Would you look at this? Look at that! You can't do it. Oh, look at that! Perfect fit the first time. I lied. I printed a cutting template that references the adjacent hole. This ensures that the switch is located correctly and looks square to everything else. Remember, this is a DIY project, so the Dremel must be used at some point. Absurd amounts of sanding and filing later, I was ready to glue the switch mount in place with a two-part epoxy. The next day. Overall, it mounted in very nicely. And from more than two feet away, you might even be tricked into thinking that it was factory installed. And there we have it. Switch installed. This is where it starts to get exciting, connecting it all together. As compared to the Tacoma T-Case, the multi-mode T-Case has additional functionality. This means that the controller has extra inputs and outputs as compared to the Tacoma's controller. These inputs and outputs are not included on the stock Tacoma wiring harness, meaning I'll have to run these circuits to the controller myself. Let's gather some supplies and scatter them over the nearest clean work surface. 22 gauge wire, open barrel connectors, adhesive line shrink tubing, some sort of wire protector, electrical contacts for the controller, electrical tape, Fancy Deutsch connector kit, optional. Label maker, wishful thinking. Heat gun, terminal crimpers, wire cutters, more crimpers, connector D pin tool. How many zip ties? Yes. Lock tight? We shouldn't need this. And then they just immediately start flashing. I'm not sure, I'm not what, sure it is. what it is. I'm getting the full. Although the Tacoma's harness has a lot of the same connectors, it is too short to reach the extra length of the multi-mode T-case. The T-case also has two additional inputs to the controller, a position sensor and a limit switch. The easiest thing to do is to splice in the Forerunner's harness into the Tacoma's harness and then run the two additional circuits up to the controller. Check out the forum post which details what to splice. The automotive environment is especially harsh. I made sure to waterproof all connections with heat shrink and protect them from abrasion. Remember that vehicle speed sensor? I also lengthened that harness by 4 inches to reach the sensor. I drilled a new hole behind the shifter assembly. 24 hours later. The hole is used to route the two new circuits from the T-case to the controller. This is much easier than following the Tacoma harness through the engine bay and back to the controller. Here you can see the routing that I used to get it to the controller. The controller takes an input from the transmission position switch. I'll intercept the signal at the connector above the glove box. Oh, I've been looking for that. Anyways, the transmission position switch lives on the exterior of the transmission. Instead of making a splice on the exterior of the vehicle, I located the circuit by this connector and spliced it in there. The new signal wire was then routed to the controller. Here's a diagram of a harness I made to connect the gauge, center diff lock switch, and the controller together. I thought I pressed record when I was making this harness, but apparently not, so enjoy this crappy time lapse instead.
Here is the end result of the harness all wired up. I've mocked up which connectors go to which switch. Both the gauge and the center diff lock switch were provided the illumination circuit. The illumination circuit is what lights up the switches in the gauge cluster at night. Here you can get an idea of the overall harness routing. For more details about the routing and the connections made, check out my forum post. So this is it. All the new circuits have been routed to the controller. The suspense is building. On the Tacoma's connector, there is one pin that needs to be swapped from one position to another. Six circuits were routed to the controller. Five of those wires go directly into pins, and one needs to be spliced into an existing Tacoma harness wire at the connector. I systematically crimped on a contact and inserted it into the appropriate pin position. I tied the all-wheel drive indicator lights into the existing Tacoma cluster indicator. As a sanity check, I tested the continuity of all the splices I made to the Tacoma harness. Well, everything's connected. This is exciting, let's test it. Doing its first test run, start her up. Lights come on, and then they just immediately start flashing. So, I'm not sure what it is, and I'm not sure if I can get fault codes from it. Um, but I'm going to see if I can replicate the issue on the 4Runner. I was able to replicate the symptoms on the 4Runner. By shifting it into 4-wheel drive without the truck moving, and then power cycling the ignition, the controller seemed to be stuck in an in-between state where it did not know what mode it was in. This seemed to bring out the symptoms of the solid indicator, then flashing immediately after. However, by putting the 4Runner in neutral and just rolling back and forth, all-wheel drive would engage and the issue cleared. Alright, so just back from checking out the 4Runner, let's try to replicate the issue again. Mission on, solid, flashing. So what I'm going to do is put it in neutral. Okay, so now we're in neutral. And since the drive shaft's disconnected, I'll just try to rotate it by hand and uh, see if that solves anything. You can see the front shaft spinning with it. So let's see if that did anything. No. Alright, kind of keep digging. So I did a bunch of troubleshooting off camera. Using the old Tacoma harness, I made this adapter harness for testing the actuator. Since I already tested the continuity of all the new connections, I was confident that the electrical connections were good. By hooking a power supply directly to the actuator motor, I was able to toggle the T-case into the different positions. Once the motor was in position, I tested the limit switch to make sure it was in the proper state. I didn't find any issues with the limit switch. However, in each drive mode, I tested the position switches. The position switches is what tells the controller that the T-case is actually in the commanded drive mode. I found that the all-wheel drive position switch was not continuous when it should have been. I removed it so I can bench test it. When I press down on the switch, it should be continuous and you should hear the beep from the multimeter, but clearly it is not working. I couldn't leave it at that. I had to know what went wrong with the position switch. As far as I know, these switches cannot be taken apart without destroying them. The switch consists of two electrical contacts, a bridge, and a plunger. When the plunger is depressed, it pushes the bridge between the two electrical contacts, completing the circuit. The bridge appears to be made out of copper, but it was black with oxidation. I measured the resistance across the area that comes in contact with the two pins. It was difficult getting a consistent reading, which leads me to believe that the failure was due to poor electrical contact. I cleaned the contact area with sandpaper and then retested it. The readings were much more consistent, which further proves my theory. However, it's ultimately unclear what caused the corrosion in the first place. Since I found no other issues and I was awaiting a new switch, I reassembled the interior. I ran into a minor issue while trying to put the shifter cover back on. When I routed the new T-case connections, I used a P-clip to secure the harness down. That P-clip protruded ever so slightly and interfered with the shifter cover. Since that area gets covered by the center console anyway, I notched the shifter cover. Crisis averted. With the new position switch in hand, I tested it. It worked very consistently. I installed the position switch and time to give it another test. Boom. All right, next, center diff. Oh yeah. All right, let's put the final touches on this. Reconnect the front drive shafts, fill the T-case with oil, <laughs> top off the transmission, button up the interior, and of course, prove it's working to the internet. With the drive shafts connected, the truck and all-wheel drive, and a front tire in the air, watch this. What you're seeing is all the power going to the front wheel in the air, which would only be possible in all-wheel drive. Now it's time for a test drive to make sure, one, the truck still drives, two, the systems are working as expected, and three, all passengers approve. And with that, step seven complete.
Stop wrenching on that truck, take it out, and enjoy it. I appreciate you all coming along for the journey, and maybe I'll see you out there.